So we're talking today about logical fallacies. What's a logical fallacy? Fallacy that's logical. Fallacy that's logical. Really good. Fallacy. What is a logical fallacy? Something that doesn't make sense. Something that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. Something that doesn't make sense. It's when someone is using bad logic, okay? And there's going to be, we're gonna give you nine examples. We're gonna give you nine examples. There are more, but these are the nine that I believe will come up again as we start talking about the existence of God and make arguments for that premise or that conclusion. So that means these are the nine I've chosen, okay? And these are very important. You're going to see them throughout uh, your life. So this is not only good for you know our subject matter. This is just good life lessons. Just like logic is a good thing to understand, right? Understanding deductive and inductive reasoning is just good for you in general, not only for this class. But understanding logical fallacies is also really good. Because, uh, well, let's just put it this way. when you Once you know them, you're going to spot them everywhere. And I don't want you to use your new superpower for evil, okay? I don't want you calling out teachers in rude ways or anything like that. We all make these mistakes, but it's good to limit them, and it's good to do our best to purge them from the way we reason, okay? We've already talked about two of these in the class so far. You guys remember what they were? Straw man was one of them. The other one was. Roadrunner. I can't hear you, sorry. Roadrunner. Roadrunner. No, that's a method, a tactic that we can use. Okay, the other one was called the false dichotomy. Okay, so that's the first one we're going to talk about. We already went over it. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. You guys remember what this is? What is it? Remember I wrote it out as an equation? You guys remember that at all? This is a play on the equation, the law of non-contradiction. So here's the law of non-contradiction. It is impossible for P and not P to both be true. Well, the false dichotomy says, oh, look, it's impossible for P and not Q to be true. They're trying to make you think that there's no middle ground. But really, they're, what they're taking away is... Actually, this... Anyway. It's when somebody falsely takes away the middle ground out of the equation. So an example, we looked at several examples. It happens all the time in politics. The old example we looked at was an old political cartoon. And it was of this young guy, and he had two choices before him. He could either be wise and good or rich and powerful. This is a false dichotomy, as we discussed, because some poor people are not wise and good. Some rich people are wise and good. And the idea was they're robbing you of the middle ground and making a very stark point. And it's just an oversimplification of, a very, of what might be a very complex issue. So we also looked at Anakin Skywalker saying, using a false dichotomy, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. That's a very common false dichotomy, okay? Fault, uh, it's when you take away the third middle ground. You're either with me or against me. Is there a middle ground there? Somebody might be neutral, right? Here's another one. You can either vote for me or vote for cr more crime. That might be a common one used by politicians. And the idea is, you know, oh, if you want to vote for the other, for my opponent, that they're for crime, they're going to, you know, let bad things happen and, and so on. But obviously, if someone could vote against you, 
uh, uh, against that person and not be for crime, right? It's a false dichotomy, it's a false dilemma. It's like comparing apples and oranges. You guys remember this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the first one, false dichotomy. You wanna watch out for this one. It's uh, used a lot in argumentation. The second one we talked about was the straw man. Okay, the straw man. This, somebody tell me what this one was. If it's a false person, like, it looks like that. Yeah, we, we create kind of a fake version of our opponent and their argument so that we can very easily knock it down, right? It's like a scarecrow. We can beat on a scarecrow, it's not gonna fight back. And so what we do is, because we wanna feel good about ourselves, we wanna make it easy on ourselves, we will make up a sillier, more foolish version of our opponent's argument. So give me an example of that. Here's one. A wife says, I'd rather have a dog than a cat. The husband re responds, why do you hate cats? Did she say she hates cats? No, she just would rather have a dog than a cat. So this is a straw man creating this false version. All right, here's another one. And this one won't get any controversy. <laughs> flat earthers believe water just pours off the side of the flat earth. How come there's any water left? Okay, so this is a great example because I don't believe that the earth is flat. I obviously believe the earth is a globe, and I think we should all believe that. However, if we're going to argue against flat earthers, let's understand what it is they believe. We don't need to make up a false version of their argument. And I've seen this happen a lot. And you know what that does? It just makes flat earthers more certain. So I've seen it happen where somebody says, well, what, you believe like the old days when the, the water would just pour off the side? And, like, where does the water go? You know? And that's not what they believe. You guys, have you guys actually looked into anything that they teach or believe? No. Mm -hmm. Look, there's like an ice wall all the way around the deep side of the thing that's really you know, deep. Right. They believe there's basically an, an ice wall and there's a, you could say it's like a big snow globe. Um, in other words, it's not some flat plane in, sp in space. It, they believe it's all a contained system. And that, like the stars are like on the, kind of on the edge of the globe. Now we can, we can poke holes into that all day. Because it's not, it's just, well, it's just not right. But what we can't, what we shouldn't do is make up an easier version of their argument to fight against, right? That's a straw man, and it's a logical fallacy. Here's another example. Politician A says, I think this healthcare plan is a bad idea because it would be too expensive and a danger to the free market. Politician B, you don't care if people die from not having healthcare. You see this happen a lot? Yeah, okay. Straw mans, false dichotomies. They happen all the time in our public discourse. It's really sad, uh, and we need to purge it from our own, okay? Let's look at it. Uh, you guys know those two, false economy straw man, well enough? Would you be able to spot one? Because that's what I'm gonna ask you to do tomorrow and in the test, okay? Next up, this is a good one. This one is very, very common. What's that? Ad hominem. Okay, this is Latin for to the man. To the man. Oh, I know. This is when what? Attacks on character. Right? Yeah. This is when you attack the person instead of their argument. You attack their character. You attack their education. You attack their intelligence. Whatever it is, you would rather attack the person than actually deal with what they're saying. Okay, this is an ad hominem attack. Again, happens all the time in politics. But this is the idea of, oh, Charles is a terrible person, therefore anything Charles says must be wrong. And so that way you don't have to actually listen to what they're saying. 
you can just ignore what they're saying because they're a terrible person. This is ad hominem. It's not a good tactic, not in the slightest. And it usually doesn't work. But we're going to actually look at an example online. And I will say, I don't think... Uh, I don't think it usually happens on a debate stage between um, between atheists and believers, but it does happen, okay? And, uh, well, I'm just going to show you an example. Uh, in the midst of a debate. Yes? No. All right. Uh, yes, go, but be quiet. Be quick. You guys gotta go to the bathroom another time. Thank you. All right. It's out there. All right. Here. Okay, so this is from a debate between uh, a few people. It's a debate that questions, uh, it's called what's behind it all, evolution, intelligent design. Uh, it's a debate on does God exist, basically, okay? And what are the origins of the universe? And what I'm going to show you is kind of the opening statement of the atheist argument, because uh, I kind of ran into this. We, we might later on in this class watch a full debate. We'll see. But I kind of ran into this. And what he does is he opens his, his uh, argument, the atheist does, with a full ad hominem attack. And he also does a straw man. Okay, So I'm going to see if you can spot them. Can't hear that. Can you, can you hear that at all? Um, no. I don't it might even be louder on the. No, it won't be. It's the video itself. It's really quiet. They fixed the the mic of the guy, but it's like after he makes the mic. So this is one of the Is there subtitles? Unavailable. All right. No, it's just that it's a very, very quiet. They fixed the mic. Oh, it was turned out a little bit. What about now? I'll repeat it. That's what you need to hear. I just want to make that quite clear because I, I, the Steve Kubo, wherever he is, there you are. Uh, it's very, very nice. And asked me to do this, so I'm proud of him. And he had to cover it afterwards. Too. All right, listen to what it says again. I'll repeat it.
you catch that? No, it's not really a type of person. Yeah. So did you did you hear it? Yeah. Coming in the front then. So he says, you know, I was hesitant to say yes to this debate because when you appear on stage with people, it gives the impression that the, the, that the ideas of the debate and the person or the, the ideas of the debate are worth debating and that the person is worth debating. And he says, in this case, neither is true. Wow. And did you hear what the audience did? They clapped, right? They clapped and laughed. Okay. So that's a rare time that ad hominem worked actually in his favor because he, had, he, he just had a lot of people in the audience who agreed, agreed with him, I guess. Um, but you should never use an argument like this. Simply attacking the person's character and uh, saying that they're not even worth debating. Did he prove anything by saying that? No. No. He just proved that he's a, he just proved that he's a rude person. That's all. Yeah, he just proved that he's being that he can be rude, right? So later on, since we're since this, you can't hear it, I'm not going to go through. But uh, later on, he gives some. Uh, He gives some strong man arguments also. So he just kind of starts off his whole debate by saying, this guy's not even worth debating. He's with this organization, and they just believe science is evil. And he just says that a few times over and over again. And of course, I've, I've, I'm reading one of the books by one of the guys he uh, is debating. The guy he says is unworthy to debate. It's a science book. I mean, he's, a, he's got a PhD uh, in, in like the philosophy of science. He's He's a believer in science, and he likes science. To, su to suggest that he thinks science is evil, that's a straw man, right? And uh, it's not actually contending with the argument of the other person. It's just making up some false version, right? So ad hominem and straw man, they usually go together. Ad hominem is when you attack the person, not the idea, okay? And again, it's usually a bad strategy. Not only is it just morally bad, it usually doesn't work. Usually the audience isn't swayed. But in this case, there was enough, there were enough people in the audience who just wanted to hear that kind of thing, I guess. That doesn't mean that he convinced anyone who thought who was in the middle, right? Okay, so ad hominem attacks. Any questions on that one? No. Next, it's called a non sequitur. This is the last of the Latin phrases, I promise. This is Latin for it does not follow. It does not follow, okay? This is when a statement, remark, or conclusion does not follow naturally from the premises. Okay, you remember how when we're writing arguments? It's when a statement, when a conclusion does not follow naturally from the premises. So remember we had our premises uh, when we're talking about uh, deductive arguments, right? So a non sequitur is when the premises don't even add up to anything, right? There is no conclusion from the premises. That's what we call a non sequitur. So let me give you an example. Jane is a terrific athlete. Uh, if you want. Uh, you're going to get the definition of a non sequitur. I'm going to expect you to be able to understand what it is, but we're going to have a couple of days of practicing it, okay? It's a good idea to write it down, but you don't need to. Uh, Jane is a terrific athlete. Jane is from Greece. Therefore, all Greeks are fantastic cooks. This is a non sequitur. Okay? This means that they can't even formulate a proper argument. It doesn't even make sense, right? The conclusion that all Greeks are fantastic cooks has nothing to do with the premises, right? So there's going to be times when people use non sequiturs. 
<coughs> Here's one. Student A is angry at student B. He says, because you borrowed my math notes, I flunked my Spanish test. Doesn't make sense, right? That's a non sequitur. When there's no connection between the premises and the conclusion. Now let's look at one that's less obvious, okay? Here's one that an actual atheist has used. Uh, he put it out on Twitter. Here's his argument, okay? Mm. Most of the water on Earth is undrinkable for humans. Therefore, the Earth was not designed by an intelligent mind for humans. Therefore, God does not exist. What? That's so dumb. Why is that a non sequitur? Let's not call him dumb. That's ad hominem, okay? That's not what I'm calling him. The argument is dumb? Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah. let's use other words than dumb. Let's say that is a that is an, Ill, an illogical. In fact, the proper word is that is a non sequitur argument. Okay. Why is that non sequitur? It's comparing drinkable water to like Okay, so in other words, the conclusion does not follow necessarily from the premises, right? The premises, like, okay, so let me give, let me just ask a question here. Okay, so most of the water on Earth is undrinkable for humans. That automatically means it wasn't designed for human life. How about the ocean has other purposes, right? The ocean has a lot of purpose in our world. We'll probably talk about that when we get into one of the later units, talking about the design of the earth. So to suggest that just because that water isn't drinkable for us does not mean that the earth wasn't designed with a purpose. The sea has a purpose, it's just not for drinking. Okay, that doesn't mean it's not been designed well or designed at all. So that is a non sequitur. The conclusion does not come follow the premises. <clears throat> Just because we can't drink water doesn't mean it's not there for a purpose. All right. Any questions on this one? Non sequitur. All right. Next up. Bandwagon. When have you heard this phrase before? Have you heard this phrase? Uh, this word, bandwagon? Yeah, we've done it very fast. Oh, you yeah? have? Okay. So, what is a bandwagon fan? You kind of like just get a go along with everyone else because they're the idiot, kind of Yeah. So, okay, I'm a Bengals fan. Cincinnati Bengals. Ooh. They are in the Super Bowl this year. They're going against the Rams. I know, LA. So maybe there's some You guys don't care. Okay, good. So, I became a Bengals fan a couple years ago because of the quarterback. He was at the college that I loved. So, anyway, long story short, I've been a fan for a couple years. Let's say I just became a fan uh, this week. What would you call me? A bandwagon fan, right? Oh, you're just doing it because everybody else is doing it. You're just doing it because they're winning. That when people throw out that term, that's what they mean. The question is, are they winning? Well, then you know, I don't think we should be categorizing people as this type of fan or this type of fan. But I think you get my point. So. When people use the bandwagon fallacy, what that means is that they're saying they're basically arguing for something because everybody else agrees or everybody else likes it. I'm sure you've heard your mom say or your dad or whoever say something like, "If everybody else walked off a cliff, would you do? Would that make it right?" Yes. That's so. It's the oldest statement in the book, right? Bandwagon is when someone uh, concludes that an idea has merit simply because many people believe it or practice it. Many people may believe something that doesn't make it right or so true. Of that? So many examples. So before we found out about uh, the Earth being round, I know I keep picking on a lot of groups, but uh, <laughs> before we found out that the Earth was round, everybody thought it was flat. Does that make it right? No. So it goes back to the fundamental nature of truth. Here's another, here's a couple more examples. It's used a lot in advertising, by the way, this, yeah. this logical fallacy. 
Everyone is getting the new smartphone that's coming out this weekend, so you have to get it too. Oh, yeah, that kind of sucks. That's a, non, that's a bandwagon that's fallacy. Cool. Okay, everyone knows that evolution explains the origins of the universe better than intelligent design. It's like, uh, that's a bandwagon. You know, it doesn't matter how many people believe something, right? Because we could say, oh, well, you know, 90-something percent of the planet believes in God. Therefore, God exists. Something is either true or it isn't true. It doesn't matter how many people believe it. Or for it. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Any questions on this one? Bandwagon fallacy. Yeah. I'm gonna shoot through these, and we're gonna have a long break at the end. So please mm -hmm. bear with me here. Uh, I don't want to stop the recording. That's why I'm not giving you a break right now. But you're gonna have a long break at the end. Okay. Yay. So that's bandwagon number. Uh, next up is appeal to authority. This is when someone uses the words of a, quote, expert or authority as the basis of the argument instead of logic and evidence. Okay, so this is if someone uses an uh, expert or authority for the basis of an argument instead of logic or evidence. So here's an example. My sixth grade teacher told me that blood is blue and it turns red when it hits the air. Therefore, blood must be blue. What's someone doing in that, in that moment? You're appealing to authority. And this is a fallacy. Because while, uh, while it might be important to go to authorities for evidence or for conclusions based on evidence, at the end of the day, what matters is the evidence itself, or the conclusion, or the logic itself, right? So we can't just appeal to authority without looking at what they actually say. Notice how a lot of these fallacies are taking attention away from the argument and put, putting it on the people, right? Whether it be an ad hominem where you're attacking the person, uh, you're attacking your opponent, or this one, an appeal to authority, where you're saying, well, this person believes it, or this expert says so. Here's another example. Albert Einstein didn't believe in Bigfoot. Therefore, Bigfoot must not be real. I was like, is that Albert Einstein's field of expertise? No. So what does his opinion matter, right? So this, this fallacy can change up. It, sometimes people use authorities that either aren't specialized, they're not, they're not in that particular field, or they're just saying, oh, this guy believes it without actually dealing with the evidence and the argument, okay? So that's appeal to authority. Next up, oh, here's an example of one. Um, this is an example of advertisers doing <laughs> appealing to authority in the olden days. Can you guys see what that says? More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's a real advertising. Back in the day, they thought the cigarettes were healthy. They thought cigarettes were healthy, and they would, and the companies, the cigarette companies, they would, they would pump out saying, "This is the one that the doctors recommend, and this one, and this one," and that, that's appealing to authority, and obviously, it wasn't correct. Okay. All right, this one's called faulty analogy. This is assuming that. Because two things are alike in one or more aspects, they are necessarily alike in some other respect. Assuming that two things are, if, uh, excuse me, I'll go ahead and say it again. Assuming that because two things are alike in one or more aspects, they are necessarily alike in some other respect. So, there is such a thing as an argument from analogy. We're going to be using some of them. In other words, to communicate your argument better, you give a metaphor. Okay, one of the big ones that we will talk about in great detail. Uh, you know what, I'm going to hold back on that one because I want us to have a full discussion on it at, the time, at that time. 
Uh, let me just give you some examples of a good analogy. Okay. Let's a good analogy, a good argument from analogy. Can anybody think of one? No, a good a good analogy first. You know what I'm asking? So, what is an analogy? It's when you compare two things to kind of explain one of them. Okay. Well, a faulty analogy is when you when it's basically it's it's not a good analogy. You're 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 taking s small similarities or uh, you might say artificial similarities, and you're saying that two things are the same when really they're not. Okay, so here's an example. People who cannot go without their coffee every morning are no better than alcoholics. So you're using the analogy of an alcoholic to say that drinking coffee every day and having to drink your coffee every day is bad. That's a faulty analogy because the consequences are very different, right? And that's what really matters. You're saying something bad, then you're really talking about the moral consequences, aren't you? So in the, in the one area that you are focusing on, that's the area that these two things aren't similar. That's, what's a, fault, that's a faulty analogy. Children are like dogs. They need to be strongly disciplined and housebroken. Is that a faulty analogy? Yes. OK. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Failing to tip a waitress is like stealing money out of someone's wallet. It's a faulty analogy. Okay. All right, we only have two more, guys. Two more. Have you heard this one before? Moving the goalposts. Moving the goalposts. So this is one evident... Okay, if you're going to write it down, here it is. Evidence presented in response to a specific claim is dismissed and often, or excuse me, and other, often greater evidence is demanded. I'll read it again. Evidence presented in response to a specific claim is dismissed and other, often greater evidence is demanded. So in other words, imagine you're in a football game and Someone says, okay, you got to kick this field goal from 30 yards away, and they kick it, and they make it, and then the referees come out and they say, actually, you got to do it again, and you got to do it from 10 yards back. And that's moving the goalposts, and it's, it's a lot of times people do this in an argument, where they will say, oh, prove that, you know, that this is true. And then when the person proves it, they say, well, I didn't mean that, I meant this. That's moving the goalposts, okay? So... Here's an example, common example. Someone, uh, let's suppose that an alleged psychic agreed to be put under a test that demonstrates his or her powers, and then they fail the test. Well, then they say, well, then they argue, well, that the test was unfair, and, you know, you had to have faith in my powers for the powers to actually work, okay? So this is moving the goalposts. Another example, suppose that a boss tells an employee that if they do X, they will be promoted. And then the employee does X, but they want they need to save money for the company, so they say, well, you know, you also have to do Y if you want to get the promotion. This happens a lot, sadly. This is moving the goalposts, okay? And it's, an, it's a logical fallacy. What? Oh, the definition? Okay. Evidence presented in response to a specific claim is dismissed and often, or excuse me, and other, often greater evidence is demanded. All right, last one. Thank you. Red herring. You guys heard this one before? You probably yeah, heard it yeah, yeah, in like a literature class. Yeah, we heard it then. So what is it in a in a story? What is a red herring in a story? Misleading evidence. Yeah. So this is 
in the form when I'm talking about logic, this is attempting to hide the weakness of an argument by drawing attention away from the real issue. Attempting to hide the weakness of an argument by drawing attention away from the real issue. So the term actually comes from fox hunting. Apparently, when people would go fox hunting, they would take a red herring, a fish, and they would like smear it across the, the trail where the dogs were using the scent, you know, and it would mess up the dog's scent or send them on a false, false trail. So this is the idea. You're, you're making an argument and you're attempting to hide the weakness of the argument by drawing attention over here. Like, oh, look over here, look over here. So here's an example. Oh, sure, I got a speeding ticket, but imagine if I crashed the car. Think of how upset you'd be. So a distraction. It's a distraction. Yeah. Like, well, okay, yeah, I would be, but that's not what we're talking about. You got a speeding ticket. You know, I'm upset about that. Okay, here's another one. A son says, wow, dad, it's really hard for me to make a living on this salary. And the father says, well, consider yourself lucky, son. When I was your age, I made $40 a week. Like, okay. <laughs> That's beside the point. This is a distraction, a red herring, okay? Any questions on that? On any of these? So tomorrow, we're going to... See if you can spot them, and, and I will give you a kind of a word bank test thing that'll, that'll have these symbols and the definitions on them. So I don't expect you, when you go into the test, to memorize the definition of each, but I need you to be able to spot them, okay? And that's going to be the goal.